Thank you, Carol. Bless you. Shall we just pray? Shall we just pray together now? Father in heaven, Father, we love you. We worship you. We love your word. Thank you that it is the inspired word of God. We want to tremble at your word this morning. We don't pick and choose. Open our ears, Lord. Open our hearts, Father, and do a deep work in our souls, in our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, it is good to hear the word of the Lord. And uh, we heard a word from Phoebe earlier on as well this morning. And that was the word of the Lord. That was from Isaiah chapter 1. If you haven't read that word before, I would encourage you to go back and read Isaiah 1. Really challenging, really powerful. And what Phoebe brought to us this morning was from the Lord uh, calling us to get right with God. Amen? Uh, sometimes we all need that, to hear that. Do you need to get right with God this morning? Have you? Is there something in your heart that is resistant? Is there a part of your heart that's wrong and off? Get right with God this morning, friend. I really encourage you to do that. And um, it's linked, really, to what I want to share this morning from Luke chapter 1. And over the Advent month we've got ahead of us, we're going to be looking at Luke chapters 1 and 2 and the preparation that was made for the coming, the advent of Jesus coming. And uh, that's what we're looking at. How did God, how was God preparing for the coming of Jesus? It was no accident. God is intentional. He works his purposes out intentionally, and he's still doing it. We mustn't ever just look back at that time through rose-tinted spectacles, just through like a Christmas card scene of the nativity, just looking at it from a sort of, you know, cute, cute manger perspective. This was actually something really raw, something really powerful, something where God worked in the ordinary and did something extraordinary. And God is still doing that today. And so we want to take the word of God, the inspired word, and also apply that word to our hearts today. And so, friends, uh, God is doing a work of preparation here around the first advent. And he's also wanting to do a work of preparation in us for his return, for his second advent. Are we ready to make ready the people prepared for the Lord? And also not only for the second coming, but even for his coming among us. We want God to come among us. As we were praying before the service today, I just had this ache in my heart. And I was praying, oh God, give us a willing, give us a hunger and a willing spirit. Because we want to see more of you, Jesus, coming among us. The advent of Jesus, where Jesus walks among us in risen power and in glory by the Holy Spirit in this church family. And then one day, Jesus will come again. But we want to welcome Jesus all the time, friends. Uh, it's very possible that we're not doing that. And we want to do that. In, in, this, in Luke's gospel, it comes at such a... This word is so important. When Luke was writing his gospel, and he started here with this gospel. I wonder where you would have started if you were given the job of writing at the account of Jesus. Where would you start? How would you begin the story? So Luke started with Zechariah and Elizabeth. And what we see here is when the angel appeared to Zechariah in the temple, it broke the silence from 400 years. Just imagine if God had not said anything for 400 years. How would we be doing with that? That would have made it. Let's just bring this up to today. 
Imagine if God had not spoken a word since 1624. <laughs> you know, that's a long time. That's before the English Civil War. And in 1624, they've been waiting and waiting and waiting. They must have, you know, you know, honestly, we don't like waiting. We've waited for like five minutes this morning. Imagine waiting for 400 years for something fresh, and another word. The last time was Malachi, 400 years before. And then the angel comes and speaks, breaks the silence uh, with Zechariah. It's beautiful. Let's read it. It says, in the time of Zechariah, and please open your Bibles. I always believe in open Bibles when hearing God's word so that you can read for yourself and learn and grow in Scripture. In the time of Herod, king of Judah, there was a great, uh, there was a priest, sorry, named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah and his wife Elizabeth, who was a descendant of Aaron. Um, do you know the name Zechariah? The name Zechariah means God remembers again. And even though there's been 400 years of silence, God remembers again. None of these things are by chance, friends. God remembers his promises he remembers his covenants. And it says about Zechariah and Elizabeth, both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing the Lord's commandments and decrees blamelessly. So these were faithful people. And I want to give them credit for that because they were living in a time of kind of spiritual desert where they hadn't had a word from the Lord in so long, 400 years, and yet they were faithful. They weren't they weren't rebellious. They weren't turning it away. They weren't worshiping other gods. These were faithful, good people, good people, godly people. They were faithful. But not only were they faithful, it says in verse 7, but they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. So there was faithfulness but also sadness in the lives of Zechariah and Elizabeth. There was brokenness. There was childlessness, which was something that was a real struggle for them. And it may, it may be that I'm touching on areas that are a struggle for people here this morning as well. And you will know what it's like, what it was like for Zechariah and Elizabeth. And, and it also tells us that they were old. And so in that way, it's, it's, it's the Bible, Luke is telling us there was no expectation at that point that they were going to have any children. They were faithful they were broken and they were sad and there was sorrow, but they were also, and they were not really expecting something to happen. Of course you wouldn't. Why would you? Nobody would. It's completely sensible. And I think a lot of us could perhaps relate to Elizabeth and Zechariah this morning. Perhaps you feel like, you know what, I've been faithful. Just thinking of, your, of yourself, you know, I, I'm living in a culture that seems to be going further from God and I'm seeking to be faithful but I'm feeling a bit disappointed at the same time. I'm feeling a bit of struggle at the same time. I'm, I'm trying to be faithful, but I'm also broken. I'm tired, you might be feeling. Um, perhaps there's a good reason why, you know, you might have been praying and you might have thought, well, you know, it just feels like the prayers haven't been heard. So what can I say? Let's just keep being faithful and not perhaps expecting very much to happen. Let's just keep plodding. And I think there's a lot of tired, plodding Christians today, seeking to be faithful, but tired, knowing that there's a lot of brokenness. We see the brokenness around us, but most of all, we see it within us, don't we? All of us do. I see, I see my brokenness. And so into that moment, into that very ordinary couple, Elizabeth and Zechariah, who experience, we can relate to. We see that something amazing happens, actually, in verse 8. It says here in verse 8, uh, Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as a priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So here we have Isaiah, uh, sorry, Zechariah, who is part of a priesthood, and you may not know this, but there was about 18,000 priests in Israel at that time. So it was a bit like winning the lottery <laughs> to be chosen. It wasn't something that would happen every day. 
here was Zechariah, you know, just, he'd probably seen lots cast a thousand times before. Yeah, okay, you know, it's so-and-so, it's so-and-so, it's so-and-so, but it's never going to be me. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've all had that, haven't we? Um, you know, it's never me. You know, other people are always winning competitions. It's never, I never get to win anything. I don't know if you've ever won anything. I don't think I've ever won anything. But, uh, you know, Zechariah was there and he was chosen and it wasn't an accident. God's hand was on that, uh, on that moment. And see how he probably woke up that morning, Zechariah, got out of bed, thought I'm going to, uh, going to cast lots today and find out who's going to be going in not expecting it to be him. I think this happens to all of us. Our expectations sometimes are really low. We keep them really low because it's very safe. It's very comfortable. And so it's okay, you know, it's fine. Let's, let's not, not expect too much. But God, that ordinary day, God's hand was on Zechariah and he was chosen and he went in to burn incense in the temple of the Lord. This would have been a once-in-a-lifetime moment for him. And then look what happened. God's hand was on him. And the hand of the Lord, I want to say this morning, is on you. God's hand is on you. The, la- the hand of the Lord is on you, friend. Brother, sister, you're here by God's grace. You're not here by accident. Any of you think you're here by accident? How many accidents have happened in this story? Do you think it was accidental that Zechariah was chosen? Do you think that was a sort of just a, a one in a million chance or one in 18,000? No, the hand of the Lord was on him. It was God's plan. God's got you here this morning. It's not by accident. It's not because you, decide, you, know, you thought, well, I'll just turn up and fall out of bed and go to church. You're here this morning because the Lord has his hand on you. You may think, well, God, goodness me, you know, I, I don't really feel that close to God. Friends, it's not the Christian feeling, it's the Christian faith. Feelings go up, down, and sideways. Forget your feelings. It's, it's God's hand on you, friend. The hand of the Lord was on me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord. The hand of the Lord is on you this morning. And the angel appeared, and there was something supernatural that was going on. And friends, we believe in the supernatural. Do you know that when the angel appeared to Zechariah, breaking 400 years of silence, angel Gabriel is still around. You know this? Amen? The angel Gabriel is somewhere doing the work of God this morning. And all the angels are doing the work of God. The the, the Greek word angelos means messenger. And the angels are still as active as they ever were, bringing messages from the Lord, bringing encouragement to people. The ministry of angels is so beautiful. And did you know that we've been worshiping with angels this morning already? We are a part of a great cloud of witnesses, uh, and we worship with the angels, with with all those who have gone before us. We're all a great cloud of witnesses together singing glory to Jesus. But the angels are still real. Those angels that appeared to the shepherds, every one of them is doing what the Father wants them to do this morning. Praise God. And there may be uh, that there are angels wor- working among our children and youth this morning. There are angels in, you, in your life this morning. We're not worshiping them, but we give thanks to God for them. They bring strengthening, encouragement, blessing, and words from God for us, and we welcome their ministry as from the Lord. So this angel appeared, uh, and uh, he sa- and the, no doubt um, Zechariah was absolutely petrified. The angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense, and when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. I mean, we would all be in the same boat, I'm sure. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will call him John. Friends, the, I, some of us need to hear the word of, from that angel today. Do not be afraid. Now, obviously, it's in the context here of seeing uh, an angelic vision, which would you know, scare most of us to, to death. But you know, the angels, when they appear, they always say to the person, do not be afraid. 
It's like there's some sort of angelic liturgy that's going on. Do not be afraid. Many of us today are struck down with fear. And because of fear, we've discounted ourselves. Because of fear, we, we withdraw. Because of fear, we run away from the purposes of God. Fear is not your friend. Fear will hold you back from the purposes of God in your life. And the angels rightly said, do not be afraid. I really want to encourage us. You're going to hear this a lot over Christmas. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. How many of us, you might need to just ask someone this morning, would you pray with me because I am afraid and I need the help of the Holy Spirit to not be afraid. I, have, I struggle with fear. All of us. It's common to our humanity. We all do. There's nobody here that can put up a hand and say, no, I am not struggling with any fear. It's just part of our humanity. But Jesus wants to be with us when we're afraid. And that our vision of him would be bigger than our uh, fear. And that we would not be held back in any way. But listen, I want to tell you something else really powerful from this statement from the angel. The angel says, do not be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Can I just share what I'm going to just, I'm telling you now, I'm reading between the lines here, but I think it's true that Zechariah's prayer is probably not a prayer he has prayed for quite a while. He prayed for children, for him, for his wife, Elizabeth. But I'm going to be honest, I think he probably stopped praying. How do I know that? It's because he's old. I mean, he wouldn't be expecting that, would he? It's completely sensible. None of us would be praying for children when we're old. It doesn't happen. So let me put, I'm going to put an educated guess here. This is me guessing. It's not, you have to read between the lines. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I think he stopped praying. So it's even more encouraging that the angel says, your prayer has been heard because it's not a current prayer. How many of us have stopped praying? Have you stopped praying about something because you, you thought God had not heard you? You thought, I prayed for years about that. Nothing happened. We, 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 we so often get discouraged, so we just stop. You know what? God's timing is perfect. God's ways are much higher than our ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so much higher are God's ways than our ways. And all I can say is I'm so grateful I'm not in charge but he is. And we've all, I'm sure many of us have been found ourselves in a place of discouragement because we didn't feel that we got the quick answer. And so there we, we discount it. You know, how foolish. We need to understand the ways of God. It will make your life much easier to understand the ways of the Lord. His ways are not our ways. He doesn't answer us like a vending machine, prayer in, answer out. He hears our prayers, but he answers it in his way, in his will, in his time, and it is for our good. And so your prayer has been heard. You can think of Zechariah going like, scratching his head, thinking, gosh, what was I praying about? I can't remember. Uh, maybe it was something different, but I, get, I bet he didn't, hadn't prayed that for quite a while. So it's encouraging. Friends, God stores up our prayers. You might have been praying for a family member. You might have been praying for a loved one. You might have been praying for healing. You might have been praying for years and years. Can I just encourage you to trust Jesus? Trust him. Put your hand into his hand and say, Lord, I don't understand, but I'm trusting you. You know you are good. Your love endures forever. So, Jesus, I trust my, what feels like an unanswered prayer, I trust it to you, Father. Because in your time and in your way, your prayer has been heard. And maybe some of us need to hear, don't be afraid. And others need to hear, your prayer has been heard. And maybe some of us need to pick up that prayer again and say, Lord, I used to pray about this. Lord, I'm bringing it back to you. Lord, would you act? Would you move? So, friends, what a beautiful thing that this angel says and brings such encouragement. So, 
Um, and then uh, the angel said to him, he spoke about the destiny, the design on John's life. He said, he will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or fermented drink, which is like a Nazarite vow. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. Like, that just blows theology to pieces in some ways. Uh, being filled with the Spirit before you're even bo uh, born? Wow. I mean, I often say to people who are going to have their kids baptized, you know that God knows how to speak to children who can't speak yet. <laughs> uh, God, God loves unborn children. Amen? He loves unborn children. He filled John with the Holy Spirit, even in the womb. May God, may God give us a love for the unborn. Um, and uh, he said, even before he was born, he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. Listen to this. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. What a statement. What a vision statement for John's life. This is what John is going to be about. He is going to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Wow. What a vision. What a calling. You know, God had chosen Zechariah and he had called John. The Bible tells us, you know, uh, that there's no prophet greater than John the Baptist. But even the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So John the Baptist has a pretty extraordinary purpose in his life. But I want to tell you this morning, I believe and I prophesy in the name of Jesus, every one of you and me has an amazing calling from Jesus. You do. You have what we could call like an original design. You have a calling. You have a prophetic purpose that Jesus wants to be revealed in this generation. And you carry it. Only you. You carry giftings, callings, anointings from the Lord that are holy, that are precious that are to be treasured and to be stirred up. So do not sit on them. Don't put some kind of bowl over your light, friend. Let your light shine so that people will see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Friends, we are called to shine brightly in the purposes of God, in the will of God. I wonder how many of us today feel like we're living with a handbrake on rather than shining brightly for Jesus. Like I said at the beginning, many Christians today feel more like Elizabeth and Zachariah than they do like a John the Baptist. We feel, we feel faithful but, but broken and tired and not expecting very much. So I want to encourage you today, friend, recognize you have a divine call on your life. The purpose in your life is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Amen? And if you're not glorifying God and enjoying him forever, you're off kilter. Get back. Get that spiritual compass out and get back on true north that God's called you. You were born for such a time as this. You're not an accident. You are, you are not forgotten. You are chosen, you are called, you are loved, all of you. It's not about how, you know, doing stuff at the front, forget that. Honestly, ministry is about you being you in the power of the Holy Spirit. Whatever Jesus gives you to do, do it with all your heart and you'll be fruitful. It could be public, it could be hidden. It could be serving, it could be administration, it could be creativity in the arts, in the media, it could be business, it could be a ton of different things. All sorts of ministries, I mean, the, 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 the amount, the, the ways that God has gifted us are so plentiful, it's like so abundant. 
It is beautiful. There are, there are people here with a callings and anointings you may not even know you had. And you might want to just ask the Lord, Jesus, what have you given me? Jesus, what have you put in my hand? Lord, help me to see who, how you've made me. Because I just want to take, take my life, Lord. However you've made me, just take me, Lord, and use me for your glory. Let me, let me just be poured out for you, Jesus. I mean, John was, had an amazing calling. And his calling was to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Do you know what your calling is? Can you put it in a sentence? I do. I know what my calling is. You want to hear it? <laughs> I, heard the, I felt the Lord say to me one day, you were born for revival. That's what I'm called for. I'm, I'm brokenly trying to do that by God's grace. That's what I believe God's called me for. What's he called you for? That's what John the Baptist was called for. What, what are you called to do? Where's the difference you're going to make? What's the, what's the mountain you're going to move by the power of the Spirit? What is the, who the people God's called you to love? Do you know? Friends, get into the purposes of God. Get into the purposes of God. And there's only one way you're going to find out. It's from the Lord. And that means time. Time. T-I-M-E. <laughs> With Jesus. So if, if anybody's too busy or rushing about, you're probably never going to pick it up. And then you'll, you'll go through life, rush, 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 rush. You'll get to the end on your final day, and you'll be thinking, you're five minutes into eternity, you'll be thinking, I wish I could have my life back so that I could step into the purposes of God for my life. But I'll tell you good news. Jesus has given you advance notice this morning. You can find it out now. Before you to do it now, before you get into eternity and you wish you could have done it differently, do it now. Do what Jesus has called you to do. So John, I'm going to finish in a minute. And here's the thing about this getting ready. John was called to get people ready. Get ready. A people prepared for the Lord. God is not an accidental God. He's not God who's just like, um, uh, you know, just all falls, falling off a log. It just all happens, it, you know, by accident. God intentionally is at work among us by his Holy Spirit, and he's making ready. And I want to ask you, are you ready? Are you ready? What God wants to do now, and are you ready for what God wants to do now? Do you know what God wants to do now here in your life, in your home? Are you ready for the Spirit of God to be at work in your home? Are you ready for the Holy Spirit to move in this church? Are we making ourselves ready? Are we preparing a way? How are we doing that? Do you, know how, do you know how to do that? How, how do you get ready for the work of God? Do you, know what, do you know what God's plans are for this nation? The Bible says the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. God, God speaks to those who spend time with him, who offer themselves and surrender to him. Would, are you willing to be such one such? Are you willing to say, yes, Lord, I'm going to get ready how many of you have been, uh, ever been surprised by the doorbell when you were not expecting it? <laughs> uh, perhaps you're in bed and the doorbell rings. What happens to your heart? It immediately, it's like panic state. Well, this is me anyway. It's like, ah, oh gosh, you know, you might be having a lion and then the doorbell goes and it's like, oh no, <laughs> I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I've got to go to the door in my pajamas. Uh, that's happened to me with various members of the parish. Uh, uh, it's always entertaining, uh, less, less so for them. Uh, but friends, sometimes we're not, we're not ready. Not ready. Are we ready for what the Spirit wants to do? If God was to suddenly send the Spirit so powerfully in our community, are we ready? Are, are our hearts ready? John the Baptist's ministry was to make people ready for Jesus. Are you ready for Jesus? Someone once said revival was like, in his community, it was like Jesus came to stay in the village. I wonder if Jesus came to move in Loughton, whether we would be ready for that. 
Are we praying? Are we worshipers? Have we, have, we, have we dealt with things in our hearts that need to be dealt with? Are we holy? Are we merciful and kind? Are we forgiving? Is there anyone that you have not forgiven? Are you ready? Some of us are not ready. I, I, I'm asking a dead serious question this morning. It is not rhetorical. This is, the, this is the word of the Lord. And why am I asking? Because Zechariah was not ready. He was good. He was faithful. He was not that expectant, but we'll, we'll give him that one because that's pretty sensible. But he was not ready. And he was one who, he took what Gabriel said to him and he sort of threw it back at him. And, you know, well, hang on a minute. <laughs> you, can't, you can't come in here saying that sort of stuff. You know, you know it's like the no we're old. We're old. We can't, we can't do this. Uh, I just want to advise you never to mess with Gabriel, okay? It's not advisable. I love Gabriel's response here. It's like classic. I am Gabriel. You know, it's like, <laughs> come on, just use your sanctified imagination for a minute. <laughs> I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and you're not going to talk anymore. <laughs> You're not, you, you need to be quiet <laughs> until you can learn what God is doing is bigger than you and all your excuses and all your exceptions and all your, what you think. Friends, it is not what I think or you think should be going on. We mustn't argue with God and we mustn't finish God's sentences for him. We must, Lord, what, however, through whomever and whatever you want to do, come Holy Spirit. We're not going to put any arguments up. We're just going to say, yes, Lord. Is that, are you ready? How many of us would want to argue with God when he moves and tell him how to do it as though we are in charge of how the Lord moves or what should be happening? Friends, let's put away all of that nonsense and let's start to get back to true north of saying, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Zechariah had to be got ready in ways that we don't want to find out. Uh, so, friends, let's get ready. Let's turn to the Lord. And beautifully, in verse 24, as I'm coming into land, Elizabeth gives birth to John. Amazing. The birth happens. And the first step was a step of preparation to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So here's my question in closing. As we prepare for God to move, what does Jesus need to change in me and in you to get us ready? What does Stop, stop thinking about other people right now. You know, or the, it's that so and so, they need they need to get ready in this way. <laughs> this is I'm not asking you about other people. Sometimes we'll focus on other people, just like in the Bible when Jesus the, the in the beach and and Peter said, "What about him?" and "What about him?" and Jesus said, "Let them worry about themselves." I'm calling you. What does Jesus want to do or change or work in you? I'm asking the question for me. What does he want to do to get us more ready? Do you know what that is? It might be getting into the word more. It might be praying. Some of us have dropped praying and we need to pick it up again. It might be that Jesus calls you to serve or to, to uh, fast or to forgive or to serve or something in his kingdom. He wants you, like Phoebe, I'm going to end where we started. Phoebe brought a word to us this morning about getting right with God. And until we do, God's not interested in our worship. He, it's like a bad smell to him. If you read Isaiah chapter 1, he, it was like he hated it. God doesn't want us to just gather here week in and week out. If we're not prepared to do the work in our hearts and in our souls, it's like a bad smell to God. He's not interested. He'd rather we went home and did something else. We need to lean in 
and turn to the Lord, repent, and believe in Jesus. Amen? And that's how you get ready. Repent. Turn to Christ. Humble yourself under God's mighty hand because he is going to do amazing things. He is going to do amazing things, but only for people who are ready and ready for it. Amen. A tough word, but necessary. So may God help us. Should we stand?